We are living in an amazing time as far as having food delivered to us. It's unbelievable. Going back just five years, this entire industry was nothing like it is today. It hardly even matters if a restaurant offers their own delivery service anymore because we now have all of these third parties offering to be the middleman between us and the restaurants by delivering the food. It has been estimated that over 111 million people in the US used one of these services in 2020, which is about a third of the population. They all use this new and specific model that may not even prove to be sustainable. For everybody involved, it has some major upsides and downsides to it. Some of the details may vary between different companies, but here's how it generally works. As a consumer, well, it's convenient, of course, but it can get pricey. On top of the price for the food, you have to pay a fee for using the service and a tip to the delivery driver. For the restaurant, it benefits them because it provides business. You may not have even placed that order if you couldn't have it delivered, but on the downside, they do have to pay a commission to the third party. For the driver, they do receive money for making the delivery based on various factors like how far they had to travel in addition to receiving the full amount of that tip that was paid by the consumer. The downside of that is that it typically doesn't add up to all that much money and in 2019 DoorDash even had this big controversy involving their driver's pay. They were drawing from those tips to pay the delivery fee. The policy led to less money being paid to the drivers so it received a bunch of backlash and has since been changed. And then for the company themselves they received that fee paid by the consumer, they received that commission paid by the restaurant, you use a portion of it to pay the driver and keep the amount that's left over. The downside of this is that these companies don't really make any profits. Again, it varies between them, but for the bigger ones, they're generally losing hundreds of millions of dollars every year. So given that there's such downsides for the users, the restaurants, the drivers, and the company themselves, time will tell if this is even a good business model. But for now, since these companies are bigger than they've ever been and seemingly getting even bigger, I think it's the perfect time to talk about them. Specifically, I'd like to focus focus on how they started and how they evolved into what they are today. I think it's amazing how these four companies that are so similar now started in such different ways. Starting with Grubhub, which is the oldest one that I'll be talking about and the only one that predates the iPhone, starting not as an app, but as a website. The two guys behind it were Mike Evans, who left the company in 2014, and Matt Maloney, who as of making this video is still their CEO. It had such a modest beginning. The two of them worked together as web developers in Chicago and were getting aggressive with the current system of getting food delivered. They would end up ordering from the same places every time because to get it from somewhere else, they would have to look up the number, have the menu read to them, then read them their credit card numbers. The whole thing was a hassle. The company that they were working for was called Apartments.com. It still exists today. It's a website that helps you find an apartment. You put in your location and it'll generate a list of apartments available for rent in that area. They figured that that exact concept was perfect to apply to food delivery. So they set up this website called Grubhub. The user would type in their location and possibly what kind of food they wanted, and it provided a list of applicable restaurants nearby that delivered. You could see the menus and actually place your order on the site. They made money by charging a 10% commission to those restaurants, which much like today, they were willing to pay it because they generated business through the website. I thought that this part was smart. Early on, most of their advertising came from signs that were placed on buses and subway cars. They were effective because people that were hungry coming home from work would see them, but also because they noticed the people in charge of switching out the ads weren't very timely, so they would only pay for short amounts of time, knowing that they would likely be left up there for much longer. After a couple of years in Chicago, they took the concept to San Francisco, and once it was proven to work in multiple cities, they were able to attract investors. In 2013, they merged with a similar service that was big in New York called Seamless, and in 2014, they raised almost $200 million through an initial public offering. So by 2016, when most of the other services were still new and struggling to get off the ground, Grubhub had been growing for over a decade and were controlling something like 70% of the market, a number that had since gone down to less than 20%. But I think that just looking at that is deceptive, because the real game changer for these companies was providing their own delivery drivers. Up until 2015, all of the orders made through Grubhub were delivered by people who worked for the restaurants. That's when they started adding their own drivers as a way to expand their restaurants to include ones that did 
didn't offer their own delivery, which actually made them the last of these four to do it, but they tried to catch up fast. Over the next two years, they spent almost $140 million acquiring smaller companies that already offered the service, quickly growing to a force of over 10,000 drivers. So keep in mind that around that time, it quickly became a different market. Postmates is the next one, founded in 2011, which has never been too significant outside of the Southwest. The key difference that I see between Postmates and Grubhub is that this one was never envisioned to be closely linked to food. The person behind it is from Germany, his name is Bastian Lehmann. The original idea that he had for it was to be somewhat of a ride-sharing service, but for objects, which I know sounds strange. He wanted to transport his snowboard a long distance, and a friend of his happened to be driving that distance and offered to do it for him. So then he thought, if there were people out there already traveling long distances, maybe they'd be willing to accept some money to take some stuff with them that someone else needed transported that same distance. His service would simply connect the two parties. It was called Postmates, I believe because it acted as a postal service between friends. It was launched in the US and San Francisco and quickly evolved into a broader service that delivered things between merchants and consumers, and quickly food just became one of the most popular things for them to deliver. Even today, their website makes it clear that they deliver more than dinner, and Lehman has even said, food is for us what books were for Amazon. So even though I think almost anybody would associate them with food delivery, that is not how they started and that is not how they envision themselves today. DoorDash was founded in early 2013 and over the past few years has been taking over this industry. As I say this, they are the largest food delivery service in the United States with a 45% share of the market. Their market share has been growing, the market itself has been growing, so DoorDash has really been growing. The main guy here is Tony Shu, who interestingly immigrated to the US from China with his parents when he was five years old and later changed his name to Tony, named after Tony Danza, who is the star of his favorite television show, Who's the Boss? It's really an inspirational story. His mother was a doctor in China, but her license wasn't recognized in the US, so she was forced to simultaneously work at three lesser paying jobs for 12 years. That's how she was able to save enough money to go to medical school and finally open her own medical clinic. That is an ambitious person, but back to DoorDash. Tony started it with three of his classmates that were all in business school studying to earn their MBAs from Stanford. The idea for it came from talking to small business owners around the area that expressed difficulties in making deliveries. These companies knew that the demand was out there, but they didn't have a practical way to fill it. So Tony and his friends started their own small business that would make deliveries for these other small businesses. He says that his mom's story was his main motivation to start a company that would help out these other small business owners. At first, they didn't have any drivers, so they would physically go out and make the deliveries on their own under the name Palo Alto Delivery. Within the year, the name changed to DoorDash, which doesn't just sound better, it allowed for a greater reach. Then, much like the other companies, they raise money from investors through different rounds of funding, using it to acquire smaller companies and to expand into new markets. In December of 2020, DoorDash had their initial public offering, giving them a $30 billion valuation. Tony Hsu had still remained a 5% owner, making him a billionaire, which is pretty crazy considering he started this company with his friends from college just eight years earlier. Uber Eats is the final service of the big four. Obviously, this one stands out from the others, being that it's the only one that was started by an already existing large company. It makes perfect sense, though. They're kind of in the exact opposite situation as Grubhub, in that they had the drivers, but nothing else. So in 2014, as an additional way to utilize their drivers, they started a small service called Uber Fresh. It was only in Los Angeles, only during lunch hours, and only part of the already existing Uber app. Over the next few years, they expanded it while focusing more and more attention toward it. In 2015, the name was changed to Uber Eats. The following year, it was separated into its own dedicated app, and their CEO, who joined the company in 2017, has said, When I first joined Uber, I think Uber was much more associated with ride hailing, and Eats was this interesting part-time endeavor. It has since exploded in a good way into a truly significant business. So significant, by the way, that during the pandemic, fewer people were getting rides and more people were getting food delivered. That combination meant that for the first time ever, the Uber Eats part of their business generated more revenue than their ride-sharing business. Now, I'll admit that is a weird circumstance, but it's still crazy to think that Uber Eats did become the biggest part of their business. So that's the evolution of the big four food delivery services in the United States that as of 2020 make up 93% of the markets. A market that, as I stated, may not even be sustainable. These 
are multi-billion dollar companies that don't make any money. Investors are keeping them running with the belief that they will make money one day in the future. But as of right now, the competition between them is making it difficult, if not just for the marketing expenses alone. Now, obviously, one of the biggest ways to reduce the competition between them would be to merge together. An example of that would be how Sirius and XM Satellite Radio struggled to make money on their own, but did very well after coming together. This is a much different circumstance, but some of it has already started to happen. In June of 2020, Uber tried to acquire Grubhub, but it was looking like it might be blocked from concerns of a monopoly, so it never happened. But the following month, Grubhub was acquired by Just Eat Takeaway for $7.3 billion. I'm guessing that only people from Europe recognize that company because it was created earlier that year from a separate multi-billion dollar merger between two European food delivery companies called Just Eat and Takeaway.com. The fact that they're from Europe allowed them to avoid the monopoly concerns while still scaling up and potentially lowering costs. Then, later that same year, Uber acquired Postmates for $2.65 billion. It didn't work out with Grubhub, so they set their sights on Postmates, which was allowed without much trouble because they were significantly smaller. They say that they plan to keep the services separate, but will integrate many of the operations behind the scenes. It was also reported that they laid off 15% of Postmates staff, and many of the executives plan to leave as well, including founder and longtime CEO Bastian Lehman. So there is already some major consolidation happening to try to improve profits, and I don't think that we have seen the end of it. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of all of these companies? I think it's interesting how they all started in such different ways for such different reasons, yet have all evolved into something that's very similar to each other. And what do you see for the future? I can't imagine it's going to be four main services like this forever, so which ones do you think will fail or merge and what'll be the outcome? Also, as a customer, what is your preference? What are the biggest differences you've noticed between them and which ones do you tend to use most? And any other thoughts you have about any of these food delivery services, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.